Welcome to Curatorial Clips, short videos by the curators at the Fralin Museum of Art and their faculty colleagues on works in the collection or areas of our expertise. I'm Laura Minton, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the curator of exhibitions at the Fralin Museum of Art. The Fralin Museum of Art and the University of Virginia stand on the territory and homelands of the Monacan Nation. This curatorial clip provides a very brief introduction to the field of American self-taught art and presents a selection of artists who lived and worked in locations across the United States. To begin, I want to read you a quote by Roger Cardinal, who published his book, Outsider Art, in 1972. In the introduction, Cardinal writes, quote, in posing the question of whether an alternative mode of art is conceivable, I hope to invite the reader to adopt a posture of receptivity towards what is unfamiliar to their experience. Once the question is accepted as a worthwhile one, answers of the sort that I am going to suggest may appear less unacceptable than they might have done at first. I am hoping to persuade the reader that to turn away from habitual cultural patterns to which they have trained to respond can be an exciting and an enriching experience provided the alternative to the old order is not senseless chaos, end quote. With this in mind, I will now proceed in discussing a few examples of self-taught artists to demonstrate that great art can be found in many places and in many forms. You will often hear a number of qualifying terms used to describe these artists, including, among others, self-taught, outsider, visionary, vernacular, untutored, intuitive, and most recently, outlier. However, none of these terms are adequate and largely serve to other these artists, defining them through their difference to the so-called mainstream art world. Keep in mind that there is no one definition for these artists and that categories are often insufficient or serve to further marginalize them. While today with the many exhibitions of self-taught artists and integration of their work into special exhibitions and galleries at museums, the acquisition of important private collections of this work by major museums, and the presentation of these artworks at significant contemporary art fairs and galleries, it would seem that self-taught art is having a moment. The boundaries are blurring between outsiders and insiders. Yet this moment is not entirely recent for Americans have actually sought these artists out for nearly a century. In 1927, John Kane became the first living American self-taught artist to enter into the mainstream art world, exhibiting at the Carnegie International. This 1929 self-portrait of Kane that you see here was on view in the recent 2019 rehang of the galleries at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Kane led the way for other self-taught artists such as Grandma Moses and William Edmondson. William Edmondson was born in 1874 in Davidson County, Tennessee. He was the son of freed enslaved people. He began making art in the early 1930s after he retired. He was inspired to create after he received a vision from God who told him to take up the sculptor's tools and to work on his behalf. Edmondson stated, quote, Jesus has planted the seed of carving in me, end quote. Edmondson salvaged chunks of limestone from demolished houses and curves from city streets. Using a sledgehammer and railroad spikes as chisels, his first carvings were tombstones for the Black community. He carved animals, both real and imaginary, biblical characters, and angels that were inspired by his faith, but also secular figures like Eleanor Roosevelt and local school teachers. In 1937, Edmondson became the first African-American artist to be given a one-person exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where 10 of his sculptures were put on view. Martin Ramirez immigrated to the United States from Mexico in the early 1920s. He first worked in the railroad industry, but after the great crash of 1929, he became unemployed and living on the streets. He was detained by the police for vagrancy and diagnosed with schizophrenia, which resulted in his internment in psychiatric hospitals in Northern California for more than 30 years until his death in 1963. Ramirez began to draw 13 years before his death and produced more than 300 drawings. 
Ramirez developed his own signature style of linear frames and concentric curves encircling a central figure. His contoured lines give a sense of depth and perspective. Many of the central figures in the works are humans, like lone horsemen or sometimes women, but occasionally a train or an animal appears. The imagery of his work incorporates what appears to be biographical motifs like railroads and trains, as well as a variety of figures like Madonnas and cowboys, but also animals and architectural structures. Ramirez initially created his works with pencil and scraps of paper, which were sometimes glued together with a variety of substances, even mashed potatoes. But he was eventually provided with colored pencils as well. Joseph Yoakum was born in the Missouri Ozarks to parents of African-American and Cherokee descent. As a young man, Yoakum traveled across North America and abroad, working for some of the leading railway circuses like Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West Show and the Ringling Brothers, as well as on railways and ships, eventually settling in Chicago during the 1920s. He did not begin to make art until the early 1960s, when he began to draw in response to a dream. Yoakum described his process as a spiritual unfoldment. His body of work consists of approximately 2,000 drawings produced during the last decade of his life. His materials included blue and black ballpoint pens, fiber tip pens, pencils, colored pencils, and watercolors. Most of his drawings are abstracted landscapes, like you see here, featuring cloud speckled skies, mountains, hills, rock formations, bodies of waters, and trees. The drawings are filled with variegated rock and landforms, textured through ballpoint pen lines and designs. Oftentimes, Yoakum included small vignettes within his landscapes. He inscribed each drawing with the, the landscape's geographic location, and in many cases, a date, either handwritten or stamped. He also made more than 100 portraits, many of well-known African-American celebrities. This is an example of a work by another Chicago-based artist named Lee Godey, who always described herself as a French Impressionist. From 1968 to 1990, she created her original artworks on the steps of the Art Institute of Chicago and sold them to museum visitors. Although not actually a French Impressionist, Godey saw the Art Institute's superb collection of this material as a touchstone of her own work. She spent a lot of time at the museum and often camped her traveling art studio on the edge of the museum's North Garden. Her works were created using a variety of media, including watercolor, pencil, tempera, ballpoint pen, and crayon. And she put all of those on canvas, poster board, sheets of paper, and discarded window blinds. She made many portraits, like the example that you see here, which were often personal and depicted herself, friends, passerby, and famous individuals. Godey created thousands of paintings and also a number of altered photographic self-portraits that she took in photo booths. And you can see one here in the left. In 1993, there was a 20 year retrospective of her artwork held at the Chicago Cultural Center and the 85 year old artist was able to attend. She then passed away about four months later. Henry Darger explored an inner realm of his own creation through writing, painting, and drawing. He is best known for his illustrated epic called The Story of the Vivian Girls in what is known as the Realms of the Unreal of the Glandeco Angelinian War Storm caused by the Child Slave Rebellion. This is a 15 volume and 15,000 page novel. The story is a war story influenced by adventures and comic books of the time. It is the tale of seven little girls known as the Vivian girls who set out to rescue abducted children who have been enslaved by the Glandolinians. Through death and destruction, the Vivian girls prevail and the children are freed from their captors. Darger first wrote his story by hand and then typed it out on a typewriter. He added illustrations that were arranged in huge panoramic landscapes and painted in watercolor. Some of the paintings are 30 feet long and are painted on both sides. Scenes range from idyllic childhood images and tranquil landscapes to images of carnage and massacre. Henry Darger's room and studio can be seen today reconstructed at Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art in Chicago. Born in 1899 in rural Idaho, 
James Castle's home provided inspiration for his work. The community post office and local general store were both housed in his family's residence. Castle's subjects were inspired by posted stamps, calendars, and catalogs that he witnessed pass through his family's home on a daily basis. Their subjects included various versions of family photos and framed landscapes. His body of work was created over six decades, and he devoted himself full-time to his art making. Examples of Castle's works include drawings made with soot and spit, such as the one you see here, construction stitched together from found pieces of cardboard, and handmade books. Castle did not date or title his works, gave no interviews, never wrote about his practice, and disliked being observed. He reworked and redrew many of his motifs and revisited subjects over and over again. Castle was also committed to displaying, hoarding, and safeguarding his work. He would gather works of a similar size into groups and then wrap and carefully tie them into bundles or fit them snugly into customized boxes. Clementine Hunter began painting in the 1940s, and she spent the last 50 years of her life depicting the everyday activity in scenes of Melrose Plantation in Louisiana, where she had lived and worked since she was a teenager. Melrose Plantation was unusual in that it had become a haven for artists in the early 20th century. Hunter painted scenes of people doing laundry and taking care of children, as well as special events such as baptisms and weddings. She said, quote, I paint the history of my people, end quote. Bill Trailer was born into an enslaved family around 1853 in Alabama. His lifetime spans the Civil War, Emancipation, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, Segregation, and the Great Migration. In the 1920s, Trailer moved to Montgomery, Alabama, and he eventually began to draw and paint in the late 1930s when he could no longer work in jobs requiring heavy physical labor. Trailer was then in his late 80s and living on the streets. His forms are simplified, but the meanings brim with complex stories, memories, abstractions, and documents of segregated life in the South. Trailer created more than 1,200 drawings and paintings, and is the only known artist born into slavery to produce such a significant body of work. The final artist that I'd like to talk about today is James Hampton. Hampton took 14 years to complete the throne of the third heaven of the nation's millennium general assembly. This work is the result of his preparations for the return of Christ to earth and is also based on several of his visions. Hampton produced this work in a rented carriage house and overall it consists of 180 components that comprise an altar, a throne, offertory tables, pulpit seats, and other objects such as crowns. Hampton labeled the components with plaques and tags, and he also filled notebooks with a secret writing system that has never been deciphered. He used discarded materials and found objects, such as old furniture and cardboard, and he covered it in metallic foil. The shimmering result is one of great splendor. Hampton's creation can be viewed at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. This is just a small sampling of American artists. But if you pressed me, I would admit that these are some of my favorite artists overall. If you are interested in learning more about self-taught artists and their extraordinary work, I have included some resources to get you started. I hope that you enjoyed this curatorial clip. We look forward to bringing you more.